Our speaker tonight is Dermot Malady, who is the author of the two volume biography of John Mendon. So, um, with hands together now, we give a warm welcome to Dermot. Thanks very much, Mary. And uh, I'd like to thank the North uh, Tipperary Historical Society for inviting me here. It's a great honour to be asked to come and speak in this lovely building and to speak about uh, this subject. Uh, it's very much in the news at the moment because of, the, of this year being the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War. Um, I'll just put up a couple of initial slides there just to give a, an, over, uh, an overview of his ancestry and his own uh, career. So he was, uh, his father, uh, you might have seen on the last slide, his father was a home rule MP. This is the famous brother who died in, in battle at the age of 56 in the war in 1917, killed on the Western Front with William Evans. Possibly better known in some ways than John Redmond. Uh, so, two brothers. The father was William Arthur Redmond, uh, and he was a close associate of Isaac Butt. He was actually Ireland's first elected Home Rule MP in 1872. He won a by election in Wexford Borough. And uh, two years after that, himself and Isaac Butt went on to found Ireland's first Home Rule party. And that became the basis of the later Irish Parliamentary Party, which was led by Charles Stuart Parnell and, and then after that by John Redmond. Uh -huh. if, you, if you go back further into the ancestry of Redmond, the early, the, uh, John Redmond's grandfather, Patrick Walter Redmond, he had a house in a place called the Deeps on the banks of the Slane River in Wexford, but also uh, he built himself a big house in, in Dublin, in Balls Bridge. He was a very wealthy man. Uh, the long term, the further back ancestry of the family is that they were a Norman Irish family uh, who stayed Catholic and therefore lost their lands in the 17th century. They were kind of a middle range nobility up to then. They lost their land, they lost possession of their lands, but they didn't uh, leave the area. They stayed on the lands and became head tenants during the 1700s, and when Catholic emancipation began to arrive, or when the penal laws were relaxed at the end of the 18th century, they, they saw them became quite prosperous, and uh, they made uh, their wealth in uh, in uh, trading in wheat and barley, and uh, that led the, the, the men whose names are at the top of the chart there uh, founded the first bank. And one of the first banks in Ireland, uh, a bank that uh, was centred on, on Wexford Town and was later bought out by the Bank of Ireland in 1825. But uh, we'll, we'll move on to Redmond's own uh, career now. The, the, the arc, the, the tragic arc, that's what it really uh, can only be called, the tragic arc of John Redmond's uh, political career is extraordinary and it's sweet. We're talking here about a man who, when he walked the streets of Dublin in the 1890s, he was hailed as a hero for his role in supporting Parnell after the fall of Parnell. Um, some, two, uh, some two decades after that, on, the, on those same streets, he was being jostled by young men who had differed from him by then in uh, his political views, in their political views. He was fighting to save the constitutional nationalist movement by then. It had been gravely damaged by events that began after 1914. And uh, by that time, Redmond himself was a dying man. Not long after that, in 1918, he was given a splendid funeral at Westminster Cathedral in London, but when when his remains were brought back to Dunleary, his family uh, thought it safer to simply put his body on the train and, and uh, send it straight to Wexford for private burial. They were afraid to bring him through the streets of Dublin for fear of um, public disorder. 
That was the measure of, of the, the man's uh, personal tragedy, if you like. There are even stories that when he was younger, uh, and known for his uh, support of Parnell, um, people used to follow him around the streets playing uh, the Fiendin song, The Boys of Wexford. There's, I should say, the 1798 ballad, The Boys of Wexford. Um, so that, that was the earlier period. The, if we start with the fall of Parnell, that's really when the story begins. The fall of Parnell split the Irish Parliamentary Party in two factions. And uh, Parnell died shortly after his fall from the leadership. He died in October 1891. Redmond then led the minority faction of nine MPs who were called Parnellites. The other MPs were uh, 72, uh, and they would be anti Parnellites. This, this split lasted for nine years, right through the 1890s. It, it was really a kind of civil war, a non-violent civil war, but very bitter in verbal terms. Um, in 1900 it came to an end. Redmond was then elected leader of the Reunited Party. After that, for some of the 17 years of his leadership after that, he was spoken of as the real leader of the opposition in the United Kingdom House of Commons. He was regarded as one of the few really great orators at Westminster, and for a while, for a few years, he was actually a pivotal figure, not only in Irish politics, but in British politics. Now, those who value the constitutional tradition of Irish nationalism are used to paying homage to the towering figures of Daniel O'Connell and Charles Stuart Parnell. Most people know much less about John Redmond, and there's an irony here because the fact is that Redmond came closer to success than either O'Connell or Parnell had. O'Connell's campaign for the repeal of the Act of Union petered out in the 1840s when his mass meetings were suppressed and he, was, uh, he balked at defying the authorities for fear of mass violence. Then in 1874, in 1874, Isaac Watt founded the first Home Rule Party, and its first elected MP was John Redmond's father. And then Parnell uh, took over as leader in 1879 from Watt, and he was the one who forged the party into a disciplined parliamentary instrument at Westminster. In 1886, he succeeded in getting Prime Minister Gladstone to introduce the first Irish Home Rule Bill. But his efforts foundered when that bill split the Liberal Party and it, um, it had to be withdrawn. And then finally in 1890, Parnell himself was deposed as leader of his party uh, in the O'Shea divorce scandal. So for a decade after that, the, the energies of constitutional nationalists were wasted in, this, in the split. So then we're back to 1900. Redmond began his leadership of the party by conciliating men who had long been his political enemies. And he was um, one of his enemies, one of his former enemies, uh, told of him that he used tact, kindness, and infinite conciliatory power. That was regarded as one of his great gifts. He was a different sort of personality altogether from Parnell. Parnell had this sort of born to rule aura about him. Uh, an imperious kind of personality, and uh, his, his um, lieutenants or subordinates in the party were always in fear of him to a certain extent. Redmond was a completely different uh, uh, personality, very much a collegiate sort of chairman. He, he relied on the advice of three or four close associates. Uh, he wasn't egoistic. He, he would, uh, usually on most questions, he would look for consensus among his uh, colleagues, and he was very tactful and very, um, as the, the, the phrase was used there, an infinite considerably power. Um, he's known for that, not just in binding up the wounds of the, of the nine years split in his own party, but he had the same attitude towards uh, the, his fellow Irishmen uh, as he saw them who were uh, divided from him. Uh, in other words, the Ulster Unionists and the we'll be talking a lot about that later, 
So he then uh, set about making the party into something like what it had been under Carmel, a well known political weapon to achieve home rule for Ireland. The home rule couldn't be won overnight. To carry, to, uh, carry the campaign to success, you would have to wait until the right political conditions developed at Westminster. But in the meantime, he didn't waste the years in between. There was much reform in legislation to be fought for in Parliament. It's true that some of, his, some of these reforms would have come in any event by virtue of Ireland's being in the United Kingdom. Some examples are the 1898 legislation that set up the democratically elected county councils. Uh, that was a Tory uh, government measure. Uh, the introduction of old age pensions and national insurance in 1908 and 1911. That was done by the Liberals. So these would have happened anyway. They weren't uh, campaigned or fought for by the Irish Parliamentary Party. But with some of the other reforms, the role of the party was crucial in lobbying for them and in uh, piloting the legislation through Parliament. And this task called for a diligent um, attendance at the House of Commons, which was usually six or seven months of the year, consummate knowledge of parliamentary procedure, and enormous patience, uh, perseverance, and vigilance. You always have to be on your guard that you weren't going, uh, that the party, the government uh, that were hoping to bring in the legislation wouldn't be defeated by the opposition in a snap vote or something if the MPs were were off on holidays or down in the bar or something, you had to be always on guard that you wouldn't suffer some defeat. Now, three pieces of legislation stand out um, among the many achievements of the Parliamentary Party. I'm talking now about Redmond's leadership between 1900 and 1908. The first one of these is the 1903 Land Act, a land, uh, sometimes called the Wyndham Land Purchase Act. Uh, up to this, about one-sixth of Irish land had been bought out by the tenants from their landlords. This had been going on since the 1880s. The 1903 Act, which Redmond played a crucial part in, along with uh, some of his close colleagues like William O'Brien, MP, and they sat across the table from the representatives of the landlords and um, they, they uh, thrashed out a, a purchase deal. The, the Act was such a success that by 12 years later, ownership of 61% of Irish land had been transferred to the tenants. So they've gone from 16% to 61%. And there were many, more, many sales were in the pipeline as, uh, by the time 1916 came. The dream of Parnell and the original land league was being realised. Uh, this was the dream of creating a peasant proprietary. Now, the second of these big achievements uh, was the Labourers Act of 1906. This enabled county councils to build cottages all over the country for the for the poorest group, uh, for the rural poor. That's the, the agricultural labourers. Similar legislation going back 23 years to the first Labourers Act that was won by Parnell. And under that Act, 21,500 uh, cottages had already been built. But Redmond got an Act passed in 1906 um, by the Liberal government that more than doubled the rate of the building, so that in 10 years, another 25,000 and a, uh, 25 and a half thousand. Uh, cottages were built. But overall, uh, if, you, uh, if you calculate in the, the, the families of these people, the, of the people who became the occupiers, you're talking about a quarter of a million people were taken out of halls and were uh, housed in comfortable and sanitary cottages, each one with an acre of land, each one with a pigsty. And this was a big social revolution. Uh, uh, um, a social historian, uh, Emma McKay, has actually called this um, a social revolution that hardly anyone knows about. The incidence of TB, typhoid, cholera went way down, it fell sharply in the countryside because uh, there was a, a, a vast improvement in sanitation and the animals weren't living indoors with the family anymore. So, uh, probably a bit chillier, but a bit more sanitary. Uh, and the third the third uh, legislative achievement of Redmond's party was the landmark 1908 legislation to set up the National University of Ireland. Um, this gave Irish Catholics uh, a long-sought long university of three colleges which conformed to their national and religious ethos. So, 
And all this was won from the United Kingdom Parliament by the elected representatives of Nationalist Ireland and Unionist Ireland without the shedding of a single drop of blood. These reforms, uh, Redmond said that these reforms left Nationalist Ireland, uh, quote, with its feet firmly planted in the groundwork and foundation of a free nation. In the autumn of 1909, an old Fenian called Captain Omar Condon, he was the man who had shouted God save Ireland in the dock in 1867 at Manchester as he was sentenced to death. Uh, he was later reprieved and went to America. But he came back as an old man in 1909 to tour Ireland for five weeks. Redmond drove him on a tour of the south of Ireland that included 1798 battle sites in Wexford. And he went to Killarney. And Mark Condon summed up his impressions in a speech that he made in Killarney. He said, We have seen with our own eyes the improvements made all over the country, and were especially impressed by the restoration of the evicted tenants. I never expected to see that affected without recourse to force. And I am glad and proud to admit that I was mistaken and that the Irish Party has been able to achieve results which we who believed in force have not been able to accomplish. Now during these years also, when Parliament was a city, Redmond campaigned tirelessly up and down the industrial cities of Great Britain to put the home rule case to the new British electorate that had grown up since the 1890s with very little knowledge of Ireland and also very few prejudices about Ireland, very few preconceptions. By 1912, um, the case for Irish self-government had essentially been won with British public opinion. And in this sense, Redmond has been called an ambassador for the Irish nation in Britain. Uh, we could, you know, we could make a strong argument that when the treaty negotiators went over to London in, in um, later on in 1921, in some, in a certain sense, or to a certain extent, they were pushing out an open door with, as far as British public opinion went. British public opinion had already accepted the idea that Ireland must have self-government. The actual, the, the, the particular form that that was going to take hadn't been agreed just yet. Um, so these achievements are part of uh, what we might call Redmond's forgotten legacy. Uh, like even people who've heard of Redmond in connection with home rule, have, very few of them have heard of that first uh, decade of legislative achievement. It made a big difference to Ireland. It, it put Ireland um, um, on a much more prosperous course. Um, but it's the even greater achievement of his later years that, by a strange paradox, has been written out of history. And the reason is because his greatest success is bound up with his final failure. The greatest success being the winning of home rule. Chancellor of the Exchequer, Lloyd George's Ireland budget. This was the, the, 
This was a very um, uh, new type of budget. Uh, it proposed to massively increase uh, government spending on social welfare measures such as the old age pensions. Now, the House of Lords vetoed that budget. So the government and the House of Lords were, were at loggerheads. Redmond offered that with the support of the Irish party in return for removing the Lord's veto. Now, Redmond, Redmond's reason for wanting the Lord's veto gone was not quite the same as the Liberals need to have it gone. He wanted it gone because with the previous two home rule bills, which Parnell and his successors had managed to get in the 1880s and 1890s, those bills were really, uh, they, had, they stood no chance because the House of Lords had a veto over them. So Redmond knew that uh, even if the House of Commons was to pass a Home Rule Bill for Ireland, it wouldn't get any further. It wouldn't get past the House of Lords. So if their wings could be clipped, or if their veto could be taken away, this was setting the stage then. So that's what, so the resulting general election left the Liberals and Tories neck and neck. And that gave Redmond the balance of power and this, was, and this is what made him a pivotal and crucial figure in British politics in 1910. The cartoon there is from Punch magazine. It's not the most clear on the screen, but it shows it's, a, it's done by a hostile uh, magazine, you might guess. It, it's a, uh, Punch was a Tory magazine, and they hated the idea that the Irish nationalist leader was actually uh, playing such an important role in British politics. They had him sitting on a, on a throne with the British constitution on his knees, and he's playing with it. And it, um, you can see the towers of Westminster behind him. And he's saying, they, the script at the bottom says, well, if I can't rule in Dublin, I can rule here. So it's a... So that, that's, that's a measure of how important he was. Um, to the Liberal, uh, to the rank and file supporters of the Liberal Party, he was a hero. To the Labour Party supporters in Britain, he was a hero. To Tories, he was a dictator. They called him the Dollar Dictator because he he had collected a lot of money from Irish Americans to fund the part of the Home Rule campaign. So uh, that was his nickname among uh, Tories. Now the outline of what happened next is fairly well known. The Lord's veto was removed in 1911 and the third Home Rule Bill was introduced in 1912. Now they, uh, I don't have time here to go into all the details of the Home Rule Bill. That's just a chart comparing what the, what the Third Home Rule Bill gave, uh, would have given Ireland with the treaty, the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The main differences are that um, the treaty really gave Dominion Home Rule, the kind of Home Rule that Canada and Australia had. Um, the difference mainly was that Ireland was allowed to have an army and a foreign service under the treaty. The Home Rule Bill didn't allow for that. But the British, in, in both cases, the British monarch would, would be the head of state. So, <coughs> then the, that's just about the financial powers. It goes into a bit of detail. If anyone is interested in those details afterwards, we can have a, we can have a closer look at them. That goes into the, you know, the fiscal powers, the powers over customs and excise and so on, which the Home Rule Bill gave. So, um, just to sum up the story, and then we can go back into the, the details. Um, and under the rules, under the new rules now, after the House of Lords veto was taken away, the Home Rule Bill had to pass through three consecutive parliamentary sessions in the Commons. So that meant it had to go through in 1912, it had to go through first reading, second reading, third reading in 1912, then it had to go through that whole thing again in 1913, then it had to go through that whole thing again in 1914. 
and only then uh, could it be passed out there. So that was the substitute for, instead of the veto of the House of Lords. So then it was finally passed in May 1914 and the King, King George V, signed it into law on the 18th of September 1914. The centenary of that is coming up in, in about three weeks' time. Now by that time the Great War was seven weeks old and they could, they, the idea of setting up a new parliament in the middle of the war was accepted on all sides not to be realistic so it was agreed to suspend the Home Rule Act, the, the implementation of the Home Rule Act. It was made law, it was signed by the King, it was on the statute book, <coughs> implementing it, setting up the parliament uh, had to be postponed. Now, at that time, everybody thought the war would be, well, they thought if the war wasn't over by Christmas, it would certainly be over by the following summer. And so they thought, right, we could easily wait another year to have our parliament set up in the summer of 1915. And so the parliament was expected to open in College Green by about September 1915, or whenever the war ended. And it was expected on all sides that Redmond would be the first prime minister of a self governing Ireland. In the meantime, he pledged nationalist support, the support of Ireland's nationalists for the British war effort. And then, in, when the, the King signed the, the Home Rule Act into law, he, de he then called on Irishmen to actually enlist in the Irish regiments of the British Army and to, to fight uh, wherever the firing line was on the continent of Europe. Over 100,000 Irishmen answered his call. But, uh, if you count in Unionist uh, Irishmen, we're talking about 210,000 uh, people altogether, men altogether. Now here it seemed, you might say, was, uh, here was the success that had eluded O'Connell and Parnell, the 40-year campaign that had begun with Isaac Butt and continued by Parnell and Redmond, that finally achieved its goal. So what went wrong? Well, the very fact that Redmond succeeded where O'Connell and Parnell had failed in getting the whole rule bill into port getting the home rule ship into port, I should say. Uh, it, it brought them up against a problem that they hadn't had to confront. And this was the existence of another community on the island with very different aspirations from those of nationalists. Uh, one million uh, Ulster Unionist people, led by Sir Edward Carson and others. Sir James Craig. Uh, Leader, leader of the British, uh, uh, man who became the leader of the British Conservative Party in 1911, Andrew Moore Law, who was himself of Ulster Unionist extraction, he'd grown up in Ulster. Um, they made clear from the beginning that their wish was to remain as citizens of the United Kingdom, and they refused to be ruled from Dublin by a home rule government which they felt would be hostile to their economic interests not just their economic interests, but to their culture and to their religious freedoms. Now, in a, in a massive uh, demonstration, a peaceful demonstration, in September 1912, almost half a million men and women signed the Solemn Lean and Covenant as testimony of their resolve. See, a quarter of a million men and a quarter of a million women signing this pledging not to accept Home Rule in their part of Ireland. Now, when the Liberal government ignored this and pressed on with the bill, then it was not long before Ulster Unionists were, pre were preparing themselves for armed resistance to any attempt to impose Home Rule on them. And this resistance then took the form of the Ulster Volunteer Force from 1913 onwards. Most Irish nationalists knew little about Ulster, uh, whether a nationalist Ulster or a unionist Ulster, few had ever travelled there or had ever met Northern Unionists. And the nationalist press and politicians tended to caricature them, they tended to, to bunch them all together as orange men, even though uh, that left out the single biggest religious denomination in Ulster, the Presbyterians. Most, Pres most Presbyterians were not members of the Orange Order. The Reddit was on good personal terms at Westminster with Carson and with Unionist MPs from both the North and South. He was, he was extremely concerned to ensure that Home Rule would not damage the economic, the social, or the religious interests 
he was, uh, in his own words, he was willing to do almost anything, he, like short of uh, giving away the concept of full moon itself, he was willing to bend over backwards. And in this, he drew no distinction between Southern Unionists and Northern Unionists, but his mistake was that he assumed that measures which would conciliate the Unionists, the thinly scattered Unionists in the South and West of Ireland, would also conciliate Ulster's Unionists. It, and the language that we might use today he just didn't get Ulster Unionism. Like most other nationalists, he, and he assumed that because our, Ireland is a geographical union, an island, that all of its people must want the same thing, the United States, a uh, self-governing state. Now, uh, like most nationalists, when unionists talked of resistance, if necessary, armed resistance, and he dismissed that rhetoric as bluff and bluster. There had been serious rioting in Belfast at the time of the first Home Rule Bill in 1886, and he expected something similar at this time, but no worse. So when Winston Churchill, that's the young Winston there, when Winston uh, Churchill suggested in public that North East Ulster might have to be excluded from Home Rule to avoid a civil war, Redmond condemned the idea uh, as a proposal for the mutilation of the Irish nation. He called it uh, uh, an abomination and a blasphemy. That's, uh, that's, it. that's what he would have looked like at one of those speeches, one of those rallies. This was a, uh, he said those words about the mutilation of the Irish nation at a massive nationalist rally in Limerick, where uh, a nationalist came from almost every county in Munster to hear him speak. And those were the words he used. And that was in October 1913. So based on his sincerely held beliefs, Redmond did not uh, try to educate his followers that some form of compromise might be necessary if serious conflict was to be avoided. But at the same time, the Ulster Volunteer Force was becoming a well-trained and well-armed force, smuggling in guns and ammunition into Ulster. And then British Army officers were indicating that, that they would prefer to resign rather than be asked to move to oppose uh, Home Rule on Ulster. So, so clearly Home Rule would only, uh, could only be imposed on, on, an un, on an unwilling Unionist population by, uh, only by brute force. Now in, 19, in March 1914 the government made the first move to respond to the, uh, to, to the growing prospect of violence in Ulster. That's another cartoon, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, that was also in Punch. Just shows four pigs. They were Connacht, Munster, Leinster, and Southwest Ulster. And the other pig is called North East Ulster. And these are the words that have been put into residence now by the uh, cartoons. It says, full steam ahead. I wonder will I make this contrary with the little loose, the way he'd come back by himself afterwards. So, he's, now, Redden wasn't actually thinking that at the time, but it was, it was prophetic because a year later that is what Redden was actually uh, thinking. So whoever, whoever th uh, thought, that, uh, thought of that caption was they were, uh, they were good as prophets. Uh, so, the deal that was offered by the government in March 1914 proposed that each county of Ulster would be given the option to vote itself out of home rule, or in other words, to stay under direct British rule for six years. So it's going to be a temporary lockdown. And for the purposes of the vote, Belfast and Derry would be treated as separate counties also. So the likely result then was that Belfast, um, Antrim, Down, Armagh and London, sorry, London Derry, I say, plus Belfast City would, would vote themselves out. But the, um, two, the other 28 counties and Derry City would opt to be in Holland because Derry City had a nationalist majority. 
And that's, of course, the most notable thing about that is that um, accountants Tyrone and Fermanagh would have been included in the whole world of state under this deal. Now, so what did, what did Carson say to that? Well, first of all, what did Redmond say to it? Redmond was presented with this by the British government in private, of course. As we've told Redmond, this is what I'm going to say in Parliament. I'm going to make this offer uh, to the Unionists. And it, this uh, idea came out of the brain of Lloyd George. Lloyd George was probably the most intelligent man in the cabinet. And he was, the, he was thinking ahead. He was, his idea was, if we offer them something now, and we say it's not that the home rule is not going to happen for six years, nobody's going to go out on the streets fighting for something that's not going to happen for six years. Uh, well, he wasn't quite clever enough, but um, the, uh, uh, Edward Carson and the, and the Ulster Unionist leaders rejected it, and Carson said that uh, this was like a sentence of death with a stay of execution for six years. So it was unacceptable. Uh, but, but Carson demanded then his permanent partition, or permanent exclusion, and not just of four counties that would opt out, but of six counties. In other words, this, uh, this meant that there was a lot of wrangling in Parliament during March, April, May, and there was no agreement right up to the summer of 1914. They couldn't agree on the principle that had been uh, agreed on that. I read it had agreed very reluctantly that, uh, okay, we will, we will concede that Ulster counties should be allowed to stay out of one room, but the actual uh, form in which it would happen had not been agreed. So, when the, fine, when the Home Rule Bill... Sorry. What Carson demanded was called a clean cut. Clean cut meant don't have individual county referendums, have just one block of six. That cut out a block of six counties, including Toronto for now, and make it permanent. And make it permanent. Now the, the unfair part of that, the, if you like, the no democratic part of it was that Jerome and Fermanagh had not very big nationalist majorities, but they had small, like 55%, 45% nationalist majorities. Um, Carson made the argument that the unionist, uh, uh, unionist population paid a much higher percentage of the, of the rates and had more of the, the wealth in, in County Toronto and so some of the British uh, politicians were then urging Redmond and, and Carson to split the counties. Now, if you look at the map of County Fermanagh, you, the River Erne runs right through the middle of it, so that would have been an easy county to split. You know, North Fermanagh could have gone to the Unionists, and South Fermanagh to the Nationalists. It would have been just impossible to split County Toronto. There was just no fair way of doing it. Anyway, moving on, when the Home Rule Bill finally passed all stages in, in May of 1914. No one knew for sure exactly how much Ulster was going to be excluded, or for how long. And by then, the Irish national volunteers uh, had also appeared on the streets, and they had the aim of defending the Home Rule Games already won. So they were, the leader of that was Owen McNeil. But the two sets of volunteers were, were now on the collision course, and the big threat in Ireland in the summer of 1914 was a civil war, or it might be more exactly, we didn't call it a civil war, but an intercommunal war. Okay. Uh, a war between Ireland's two communities, which might have been very bloody. Now, uh, in late July, Redmond was preparing to make a, an important new offer to Wall Street Unionists because he was now frightened for the first time, he, had, he, he was now taking the threat seriously of serious uh, civil war or intercommunal war. And he, he, uh, he was getting ready to make a new offer to the Unionists as the price of peace. And what he was going to do was he was going to take away this, the six year time limit and say that. Unionist uh, counties could stay out for as long as they liked, which effectively meant permanent. Uh, he would have said indefinite because he always would hold out hope that 
they will, you know, if we make the home rule state a good state to live in, they will want to join us uh, within a few years or a few decades. But it was effectively permanent partition that he was offering. But he would dig in his heels on the other part of, of the deal. He would not agree to the clean cut of six counties. He insisted that, you know, if we're going to have democratic majorities opting out in the unionist counties, well then, sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander, we, the, we have to respect the democratic nationalist majorities in Tyrone and Fermanagh. Now, we will never know how that offer might have been received, because the, the debate that he was planning to make it in never took place. And the reason it didn't take place was because the First World War intervened on the 3rd of August. So you could say that um, there's a possibility that the Great War in Europe actually stopped or averted a small local war in Ireland. We don't know if a small local war would inevitably have broken out. If Redmond had made his offer, maybe the Unionists, or a good part of the Unionists in Ulster might have accepted it. And the others may what uh, might have thought it's not worth going to war if we're split. But we'll never know. So thus King George signed the Home Rule Act into law on the 18th of September. King George there. And the problem with that was like we have to look at the two dimensions of this. On the one hand, it's a marvelous uh, victory because this is the culmination of a 40-year campaign and now the King of England has signed it into law. On the other hand, everybody knew that it won't, that this new parliament won't rule the whole of Ireland. Some parts will be left out of it. But nobody knew exactly how much. So nobody knew where the actual territorial remit of this parliament would stop. So that meant that it, it couldn't be implemented until they got agreement on, on the um, partition proposals. Now, on the 3rd of August 1914, just before uh, Britain's entry into the war, Redmond stood up in the House of Commons and he made the first of what are probably his two most famous speeches. This one was to pledge the support of the Irish nationalists for the British war effort and to tell the British leaders that uh, they could take their troops out of Ireland and that the volunteers, both the nationalists and the unionist volunteers, would guard the shores of Ireland against invasion. That's Redmond view, uh, reviewing uh, a corps of the Irish national volunteers at Marlborough, now Port Leach, in the month of August 1914. Now, it took seven weeks then before the King actually signed the Home Rule Act into law, and at that, that weekend after the King signed, uh, Redmond came home to Ireland, pushed with victory, of course. And he went straight down to his straight down to his home, which was in Ockavana, in the heart of the Wicklow Mountains, the old barracks that was on the, uh, the old British Army barracks that Parnell had used as a hunting lodge. This was now Redmond's home in Ireland, a very secluded place. But as he was driving down to his home, he stopped off at Wooden Bridge. He noticed that there was a platoon or a company of Wicklow volunteers drilling on the Sunday morning outside the Wooden Bridge Hotel. It's now a golf course. This was on Sunday, the 20th of September. So he stopped the car and he got out and he made a speech. Now, there was nothing really new in the speech because he had said in Parliament only that very week that he would make a speech like this when he, at the first chance he got when he came back to Ireland. But this was what he said anyway that. Um, He told the Irish volunteers that they should go on drilling, but that they should account, he said, account yourselves as men, not only in Ireland itself, but wherever the firing line extends, and in defence of right or freedom of religion in this war. It would be a disgrace to Ireland if young Irish were to stay at home uh, to defend the coasts. So now, why did he say that? Uh, <coughs> 
a few days earlier when he spoke in the House of Commons, he had said that, that in passing and in signing the Home Rule Act into law, the British democracy had kept faith. So the British democracy has kept faith with Ireland. So I would say from the public platform, I would like to argue that it is their duty and should be their honor to take their place in the firing line. You can see there the other elements in that speech where that he thought that his, he, that he was now pinning his hopes on something new, which was that the mere fact of unionist and nationalist parties were going to fight side by side against a common enemy would bring them together to such an extent that they, there wouldn't be any need for partition when the war ended. And that, we could say now in hindsight, that was very much a pie in the sky idea, very optimistic, very naive. Uh, um, it's always easy in hindsight to say these things. Uh, maybe at the time, you know, people were getting carried away with all kinds of emotions at that stage with the war coming on. The immediate effect of Redmond's Woodbridge speech was that it brought an open split with the volunteer organisation. And over the month, the following month, nationalist volunteers held meetings all over the country. And then they voted. They voted for or against Redmond's stance on the war. 93% of them voted to stay loyal to Redmond. 7% voted against. The committee that had set up the volunteers, they called themselves the original provisional committee, which included people like Patrick Pierce, they expelled Redmond from the volunteer work, and they declared him expelled, even though they were the minority of 7%. The minority in Dublin was bigger than 7%, it was more like um, I think it was about 20, uh, 28. Uh, the vote in Dublin went about 72 to 28 for Redmond. So it was a more significant minority against. And what they accused him of was two things. They said that, that he had consented to the dismemberment of Ireland. They didn't know. They didn't know the speech uh, that he had been intending to make, which was to take away the time limit of six years. So, as far as they were concerned, they only knew in public that that he had agreed to temporary partition. But even on that, they condemned him for that for dismembering the nation. And then the second charge was that he had um, declared it to be a duty of the Irish volunteers to take foreign service. Only it's not Irish. He had said that since Britain had kept faith with Ireland, then it was now time to repay a debt of honour by fighting for, for Britain. So, moving on now to the war itself. The war, in the first year, the war was very popular in national Ireland. Both uh, the main daily papers uh, sold by, to national, uh, bought by nationalists in Dublin uh, carried to the recruiting advertisement, your king and country need you, God save the king. And in the provinces, newspapers which had been aggressive in promoting the volunteers, they now endorsed Redmond's hand of friendship to the ancient enemy. One provincial paper welcomed, quote, the comradeship of a defensive alliance with England. And uh, uh, another provincial paper carried the headline, Bravo England. Redmond went to Mass at Balbriggan in the county Dublin in early August. And he told a colleague afterwards that the priest had begun by calling for prayers for England. And the whole congregation knelt and followed him as he uttered the prayer. Cheers for England have been given in every town in Ireland. So now, what was behind a lot of this enthusiasm? Well, the answer is one word, Belgium. The first stories of, the, of German atrocities in Belgium 
which was a small Catholic country with which Irish nationalists uh, could easily identify. And it was also a Catholic country that Ireland had long links with going uh, back to the 17th century. These atrocities were being reported in late August. The Germans were massacring civilians and uh, burning towns. And this had begun on the second day. Um, now, at the time, a lot of people were skeptical about this and thought that they were um, dismissed it as war propaganda. But actually, a, a book that came out only four years ago by uh, two Trinity College academics, and uh, it is actually documented that 6,500 Belgian and Luxembourger and French civilians were shot by the Germans. And they were shot by, on the least suspicion of carrying a weapon. And anybody who was seen with, uh, on the streets and was uh, suspected of, of shooting a German troops was just put up against a wall and shot. So, 6,500. So, this, these reports were coming in on the, the newspapers. Uh, Tom Kettle, who you might have heard of, he was one of the, uh, uh, had been an MP in the Irish Parliamentary Party. He was also a professor of economics in the new university, uh, UCD. He was uh, acting as, uh, he was in Belgium actually at Redmond's bidding to buy guns for the volunteers. Um, and, uh, he found himself uh, uh, stranded in Belgium when the war started. So he became the war correspondent for the Daily News and he wrote about the horrors that had overtaken Be uh, Belgian cities. Um, and then the, the town of Louvain was a town that had a long, a long history of association with Catholic Ireland. It was an Irish college trained for training priests at Louvain. Now, they, uh, when the Germans shelled Louvain, they burnt down 2,000 buildings and killed 248 civilians. So that was, uh, that aroused particular horror. And one of the Irish newspapers called it War of the Barbarians. Now, Redmond, Redmond followed up his Woodbridge speech by speaking on platforms all over Ireland to encourage young nationalist men to enlist in the Irish regiments of the British Army and especially to join the Irish Division. Uh, which was called the 16th Irish Division. We now move forward a year and a half. Sorry, I'm just. That's a, that's a typical recruiting poster from 1915. We now move forward a year and a half to Easter 1916 and the insurrection. And the impression is widely held that it was a response to popular discontent at the postponement. Of the implementation of home rule. But we must uh, try to realize that the people who organized the insurrection were, they had no interest in implementing home rule. Um, they despised home rule as a seller. They were dying in the world Republicans who were uh, members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And they, had, they saw home rule as a seller of what they saw as Ireland's national aspirations. But even though the majority of Irish nationalists had voted um, in election after election for home rule. They, they regarded it as a sellout. So the, the rebellion really was a conspiracy organized by a tiny group, which uh, was the military council within the IRB, who had planned since 1997 to take advantage of the next war in which Britain was engaged. And, and they decided to go ahead with it just after the war broke out in August 19. And they had to keep their plan secret, even from fellow IRB leaders like Bulwer Hobson. Never mind from non-IRB uh, uh, leaders in the volunteers and rank and file volunteers. So many of those men who marched out on Easter Monday morning uh, did not know that they were taking part in a full rebellion. They, they thought they were going on another set of maneuvers. The full extent of the rebellion was only revealed at the very last minute. Redmond was in London when Dylan informed him of the rebellion. He had to send a, a letter by special courier to London to tell him. So Redmond was horrified. He, he, stood, he stood up in, in the House of Commons and spoke of his detestation and horror. And he called it treason to the cause of home rule. And he gave us with his view that the ringleader, that cars, that as our casement and the other ringleaders would have to be dealt with in the most severe manner possible but that the rank and file should be shown the greatest possible leniency. There is some truth in the story that he 
he certainly he didn't call for the execution of the first few leaders. He did approve it, but after the first day, uh, three of the fifteen leaders were executed on the first day. After that, he start, uh, he began to plead with the prime minister that there should be no more executions. So this brings us to the question of what brought us, what brought about the collapse of nationalist support for Redmond and for the Irish Parliamentary Party. Well, the usual story told is that after the rising was suppressed and the 15 leaders had been executed, the wave of anti-British emotion that swept the country generated a demand for a complete break with Britain and made home rule no longer a viable uh, political option, no longer acceptable to nationalists. And then, to add to this, Redmond's support for the Allied war effort and his encouragement of recruiting the British Army, they came to be judged as a big mistake, or in the eyes of some, they were judged as national treachery, completely out of sympathy with the new rule after 1916. Now, it's, it's, that is a generally accepted narrative, but really, it, was a, it, it wasn't really as simple as that. We need to qualify that view. Um, some of it comes from reading history backwards. We must try and avoid reading history backwards. We must try, we must try to avoid looking at 1916 through the lens of the prism of 1919, 1921. The fact is that in the summer of 1916, with uh, O'Connell Street lying in the road, there was still no organised alternative to the Irish Party. No political force which could capitalise on the way of anti-British view. Sinn Féin was still a collection of small clubs scattered around the country. They had no organised leadership. Some nationalists might be emotionally swayed by the idea of the Republic that, that had been proclaimed at the GPO, but to the majority that sounded like an unattainable goal in practice. So some form of home rule within the empire was still, still looked like the only available political option. But there was one, one issue, however, on which Redmond and his party were exposed and vulnerable. This was the likely prospect of partition. This was the likely prospect of partition that home rule came to be implemented after the war. So this was the mutilation that Redmond had condemned only less than a year before he had accepted it. Before Easter 1916, the nationalists could still take some comfort from the thought that nothing had, been, nothing had yet been set in stone without partition. But, and Redmond, for his part, hoped that the common, uh, fighting the common enemy at the front would forge a new common Irish identity. But then, a month after the rebellion, the British government initiated a new effort aimed at bringing home rule into immediate effect. They had, this was a, a very this was a, a sort of pattern of British behaviour that whenever they enacted a measure of repression, they would bring in a measure of conciliation with or shortly afterwards to balance things. So having executed 15 leaders, they thought, now we have to do something to conciliate the Irish. So they uh, asked, asked Lloyd George to try to bring Redmond and the Unionist leaders together and to try to get an agreement to get Home Rule, to get the Home Rule Act, which was now on the statute book as we, as we said, to get that into immediate effect. So Lloyd George <coughs> Lloyd George there as a younger man, we used to see him as a silver haired old man, but that's him when he was middle aged. And um, Lloyd George was a very, a very clever negotiator, um, nearly too clever sometimes. What, what, he, what he did was he set up a shuttle diplomacy. Remember when Henry Kissinger used to try to get the, bring an end to the Vietnam War, he would, shoot, he would move between Hanoi and Paris, speak to the different leaders. He, the different leaders never met in person around one table, but he would uh, shuttle back and forward between them. And this is what Lloyd George did between Redmond and Carson. Shuttle diplomacy. The big danger with shuttle diplomacy, of course, is that you're telling one group of, of people what the other side seems to have agreed to, and then you're telling them what the first side seems to agree to. The big danger is that each side may take a different meaning from the words. And unfortunately, this is what happened in the summer of 1916. And 
it was agreed that this was the proposed deal that um, instead of having county plebiscites, they would exclude a six count poster block. So that would include um, Tyrone and Fermanagh. But it would be only excluded provisionally until a year after the war ended. And after that, for another, for, uh, until Parliament made uh, permanent arrangements. So the word permanent was not used by, by Lord George. The word provisional was used. Now, Redmond took the word provisional to mean temporary, but you know, temporary but maybe becoming indefinite later on. Whereas Carson took a, a provisional to mean permanent, full stop. And so the draft agreement collapsed in July and made a bit of dispute over the meanings of words over the meanings of permanent, temporary, and provisional. And it, it, was a, it was a tragedy because both Car Carson had worked very, very hard to get the agreement of the Ulster Unionist Council in Belfast to agree to something that wasn't permanent. And um, Redmond had worked very hard, uh, especially Joe Devlin. Joe Devlin had done the most to try to, um, um, try to persuade Ulster nationalists to accept this deal on the understanding that the whole thing would be looked at again a year after the war ended, would be looked at uh, by Parliament. So, this was the thing that really did terminal damage to Redmond and to the Irish Party. This episode, uh, he never really recovered from this. Uh, from the damage caused by this, because it looked like he had conceded permanent partition and he got nothing in return. He hadn't got home rule for even 26 counties, never mind 28. So, So that was the terminal damage that, that this episode did, and William Martin Murphy did the rest. And what do I mean by that? Do we, uh, the name William Martin Murphy might ring a bell from uh, what we were uh, commemorating last year, the lockout in Dublin, 1913. William Martin Murphy was the, 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 the Ireland's wealthiest businessman, most powerful businessman, owner of the whole Dublin tramway system, but also uh, the owner of independent newspapers. Uh, he was a very, very powerful man, but he had a grudge against John Dillon and John Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party he, he, because he had stood as a candidate in the 1890s and he'd been rejected. And he had a deep hatred, for, uh, especially for Dillon, not so much for Redmond, but for John Dillon, he bore a deep hatred. And he, 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 he used his newspaper to attack the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, whenever he could. So, uh, um, in an age of mass of mass literacy, but before there was any radio or television or internet, newspapers were the only mass media, and they were the dominant influence on public opinion. The Irish Independent was by far the most powerful newspaper. It, the circulation every morning of the Irish Independent was seven times greater than the Freemans Journal, which was the Irish Party's own newspaper, if you like, or one that was most sympathetic. The paper was pro-war. It, it carried a daily list of casualties and photographs of Irish officers killed in the war, and it supported recruiting for the British Army, and even expressed sympathy with the idea of conscription. But, William Martin Murphy got priced it at a halfpenny, which was only half the price of the Freemans Journal, so it was a clever move. And, uh, they had run a campaign against the party in 1915. And now, after the Lloyd George deal collapsed in 1916, the Irish Independent went into overdrive. It, had a, it, it, it carried editorials day after day, land-based in Redmond, for his acceptance of the new partition proposal. 
And I'll pull up the number of the address. It's just amazing when you read the, the independent at that time. There were 13 consecutive days in June and 16 consecutive days in July with uh, editorials condemning partition and blaming rather than the large part of the And out of 52 uh, issues in two months, there were 38 altogether. And some of the sample headlines, and of course they, they, they put a little box on the page in the Irish Independent with quoting that line that Redmond had spoken at Limerick in 1913 that um, partition would be the mutilation of the Irish nation and they, uh, they wrapped it around his neck like an albatross they just wouldn't let him forget the words that he had used, mutilation and the, so they call, uh, the editorial was referred to the mutilation scheme or the term partition into perdition and so on so the effect this campaign had a huge effect on the public mind and uh, I'll just give one example from, a, from one provincial paper called Midland Reporter, which I think was in County Offaly, on the 6th of October 1916. And the editorial said, He has been found out as a political humbug and an imposter who was willing to carve up Ireland and sell our northern price in exchange for a Dublin Castle of Brian for himself and his lackeys. Ireland has no further business with a leader of that type. In other words, you could say it's fair comment to accuse him of the political crime, but uh, putting him, uh, ascribing a low motive to him there, that he was doing it for a bribe of money, was, that was very low, because uh, he was a very honourable man, who, you know, and did uh, agree or disagree with him on political matters. He would never have taken a bribe of any kind. But anyway, that was the kind of invective that started circulating. All weapons were regarded as fair at that stage. Now, the result of all of this was evident in 1917. The Irish Party lost four by-elections in a row between February and July, and Sinn Féin was suddenly emerging, burgeoning. Uh, the four by-elections were in uh, uh, South Roscommon, or uh, sorry, South Leitrim, North Roscommon. Um, East Clare and Kilkenny City. Eamon de Valera, who uh, was just released, he was the only, the only uh, commandant of the 1916 rebellion that hadn't been shot uh, because of his American citizenship. He was, um, he was now released from the British jail in the middle of 1917. And he stood in East Clare where uh, Willie Redd, John Redd's brother, had been, uh, he no longer had the seat because he had been killed in June at the Western Front. So Eamon de Valera took that seat. Revan tried to backtrack on partition and he declared that he would have no more to do with partition proposals. But this did him no good with the electorate. He was not to be forgiven, especially by young people who were voting for the first time and for committing what was seen as the ultimate sin against the Irish nation. He struggled on for another eight months in a last ditch effort to find an all Ireland settlement, a constitutional settlement at, at, at the Irish Convention. The Irish Convention was a, a meeting of, of Irishmen from all over the island who tried to hammer out an all Ireland form of home rule, but it, 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 it didn't succeed. And during this time, he was also struck by family bereavements. His eldest daughter, Esther, uh, had married um, um, a doctor, um, William Power from Waterford. They had moved to New York. She was living in New York City. She died suddenly at the age of 33. That bereavement was a sore blow to Redmond. Redmond himself began to suffer repeated bouts of illness. And he died on the 6th of March 1918. Just, the, the final two slides will show the difference, that, that the change that took place in him over just two years. by Sir John Lowry in 1916. And he looks a saddened man, but he still looks very much in his full health and pretty vigorous. That's him a month before he died in 1918. 
that change had happened in the space of 18 months. Um, he was a sick man. Uh, he told a friend that he was a broken-hearted man by the time he died. All three of his life's uh, projects fell apart within a few months of his death. The 16th Irish Division was practically wiped out as a fighting force on the Western Front, and the Germans broke through on the morning of the 21st of March. So it was just a fortnight after he died. The Irish Convention, which was the last chance to save constitutional nationalism, broke down in, in disagreement in April. And then, finally, in the December 1918 general election, the Irish Party was wiped out by Sinn Féin, or almost wiped out. They held on to six seats, and Sinn Féin won 75 seats. Although the voting wasn't quite as drastic, the difference in voting wasn't quite as drastic, but it was the first past the post system of elections, so that's why Sinn Féin did so. Uh, 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 gathered nearly all the seats. The voting went 47% for, for Sinn Féin uh, to 22% for the Irish Party. So now, how do we assess Redmond's legacy? Well, on the one hand, he achieved his life's goal of getting, uh, getting self-government for Irish internal affairs onto the statute book. But on the other hand, um, this victory was snatched from his grasp by two factors, one that he had not understood until it was too late, uh, uh, which was the determination of the Ulster Unionist community to go its own way, and one uh, that he had underestimated, which was the determination of the men of violence in his own community to stay the revolt against Home Rule. The Sinn Féiners who inherited the mandate of the Irish Party, they had no realistic prescription for averting or later for undoing partition. And in the general election of December 1918, they, they virtually ignored Ulster and they concentrated on the question of separation from Britain. And in the treaty debates in 1922, they again ignored partition, even though by then it was a fait accompli. They couldn't undo it by then. So uh, nobody after Ireland had any better uh, idea of how to avoid or how to undo it. And it was easier to find a national scapegoat on which to blame it. Redmond fitted the role of scapegoat perfectly. And after that, for about 70 years, it was consigned to the realm of, of rhetorical pieties. To see the depth of Redmond's fall, we need only consider the ignominy of a funeral that could not enter the city, to whose restoration as an independent capital he, he had um, devoted a lifetime of his energies. And there's no monument to him in that city. If you stand on the common bridge and look north and see the common monument in front of you, and the Parnell monument further on, if you turn to your right to see the bridge named after Isaac Butt, but you don't see any monument to John Edmund. The, the tragedy for, for Ireland was much bigger than Redmond's personal tragedy. But he had not formally recognised the principle that Irish unity could only come about with the consent of Union Stolster, he wished above all to avoid Irish self-government being, being drowned in blood at birth, or as he put it, being baptised in blood. Something like that, however, did happen, because between January 1919 and April 1923, there were uh, really, in effect, three separate uh, conflicts that left about 6,000 people dead in 51 months. And it also caused the loss of the skills and wealth through emigration of a large part of the Southern Unionist community. It, it, took, uh, it took many decades before Nationalist Ireland began to tell itself the truth about partition and to accept that the problem was one of reaching accommodation with another community on the island. Um, I think the, the death just a few days ago of Albert Reynolds really points this up very publicly. It was really a question of reaching accommodation with, with another community rather than uh, talking about a conspiracy created by a power across the water. And in the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, the people of this state agreed overwhelmingly by referendum to accept formally the principle of consent when we agreed that the territorial claim should be removed and should be rephrased as an aspiration to unity, to a peaceful aspiration to our unity. So Redmond never formally accepted the principle of consent, but he abhorred the notion that our self-government might be born in bloodshed and, and in the coercion of unwilling people. The case for rehabilitating Redmond and his legacy uh, rests on the notion that 
On Good Friday in 1998, we were, in, a, in that sense, finally catching up with you. I'll end on that.